been on the list for quite a while is a guy called Dr. Tuesday Lobsang Ramper. Maybe you have heard of him. I certainly hadn't. He wrote about life in Tibet, what it was like to be a Tibetan Lama. He wrote about the occult. He wrote about supernatural things. He even wrote about space travel and going to Venus and wrote a book, believe it or not, that he said was dictated to him by his cat, Mrs. Fifi Grey Whiskers. He made a lot of money, this guy. And many students of Tibet and Tibetan philosophy found themselves stimulated by his first-hand account of living in Tibet and being a llama there. Then it was discovered that Dr. Tuesday Lobsang Rampa didn't actually exist, or at least his real name was Cyril Hoskin. He was a plumber from Devon in the south of England. He'd been climbing a tree one night looking for owls when he'd fallen, hurt his back, and couldn't be a plumber anymore. And he claims that while he was in hospital recuperating, he was visited by the spirit of a Tibetan Lama. And from then on, he wrote books as that person. Well, many people said, oh, he's just a con artist. It's all a scam. There's no way that this guy was uh, really experienced in Tibet. He never went there. How could he possibly write about Tibet? And yet people who studied his work say, you know, it's kind of uncanny <laughs> how he knew about this stuff. Maybe he was channeling a spirit. It's anybody's guess whether he was genuinely channeling a Tibetan Lama, but Cyril Hoskin died in Calgary, Canada in 1981 at the age of 70. I'm not quite sure what of, and it's not reported anywhere. But somebody said, will you please do his transition pictures? And sheer curiosity had me go looking into his energy to see what happened. And when I found Cyril Hoskin, he was staggering around holding his stomach. So maybe he had a stomach problem when he died, but he was staggering around, clutching his gut, like, oh, oh, oh. But the weird thing was, as he went through these histrionics, he had one eye open, looking at his audience. He wanted to be noticed. He wanted people to see that he was in pain. Oh, oh. As I watched, he staggered into that little connector tunnel that I very often see that separates form from formless. It's the crossover point. But as he entered it, I felt a sense of tremendous relief as if the heaviest burden imaginable had been lifted from my shoulders. Like, oh, no more pretense. Or, whew, I got away with it. I went my whole life and did this, and now I don't have to account for myself anymore. It was a tremendous lifting of a terrible burden he had been carrying. But now he faced a dilemma. Did he have to continue pretending? How far did he have to take this? He'd fooled humans while he was alive, but did he have to fool God? That seemed to be an issue. Just in case, rather than walk, which he could have done in his consciousness, he continued the drama right to the very end of the tunnel until he got into that metaphorical, symbolic cave that I always see. It's like a meet and greet area um, when you arrive. And he saw there was nobody there. I was like, oh, okay, I don't need to pretend then. And he just stood up in his consciousness, stood up and walked around. But then there was the tunnel. And the tunnel led to the light because that's where the tunnel goes. And he was once again overtaken with a degree of, I won't put it at fear, but certainly strong trepidation that he might be judged by the universe for conning people into buying his books all that time. 
It really seemed to haunt him. And the tunnel was incredibly steep. It was almost like the universe said, you need to sweat this one off. Let's delay this while you figure out your connection to your mortal life. So he put in the effort and got to the top and that wore down his resistance. And then he stood before this light that I always see. But unlike other people who see this as their chance to ascend to higher realms, this guy felt like he was about to be executed. It had that feeling. You know, in France, in the old days, you'd stand before the guillotine and you'd be like, oh my God, I'm about to be beheaded. It was like that, as though he was going to be executed for his misdeeds. Back on the human side, there had been a sense of being special, different, having achieved something. Now that he was here, though, he felt kind of dwarfed by circumstance, by consequence. Eventually, he stepped into the light and said, oh, well, here we go. Accept my fate. But of course, he was welcomed by grace and it was fine. It was all in his consciousness. But there must have been tremendous guilt that weighed this guy down at a conscious level for most of his adult life. It didn't seem like a good transition at all. Not because it couldn't be good, not because he wasn't okay, but because he imagined that there was a penalty to pay for doing what he'd done. And maybe in life, he just brushed it aside and said, ah, it's no big deal. On the other side of the divide, it was a big deal. And... Uh, he found it very difficult to handle. That was Dr. Tuesday Lobsang Rampa. <laughs>